denied the opportunity for face-to-face -face pageantry. This was how Saudi Arabia opened the G20. A seven-plane flyover of Riyadh to mark the first ever summit hosted by an Arab country. On the ground, King Salman beckoned the world's most powerful leaders, bureaucrats and despots to meet the challenge of their generation. It is unfortunate that we are unable to host you in person due to the exceptional circumstances we are all facing. As he spoke, flanked by the all-powerful Crown Prince, some participants were running late. The Russian and Turkish delegations in particular when Vladimir Putin did arrive, he backed the summit's calls for the poorest to get access to a vaccine. Russia supports the draft key decision of the current summit, aimed at making effective and safe vaccines available to all. There is no doubt that drugs for immunization are and should be accessible to everyone. Saudi Arabia's human rights record had led to awkward questions. The faces of jailed female activists projected on the Louvre in Paris. But many leaders concluded that working together with the Gulf Kingdom to tackle COVID-19 was a matter of urgency. To this end, we need to sustainably strengthen the World Health Organization. We need reliable funding, better cooperation, greater independence, and the G20 can provide important, indeed crucial, support in this area. In lieu of the traditional family photo, the hosts projected a mock-up of their own onto an 18th century palace. It seemed to capture what may well be one of the strangest and most important G20 summits ever. For more on this, let's go straight to Brussels Bureau Chief Alexandra von Namen, who's following the summit for us. Alexandra, good to have you with us. COVID-19 and vaccine distribution was on Saturday's agenda. Tell me, what did the leaders agree on? Well, we expect the leaders to sign a joint declara declaration later today, uh, and then we will see how strong the language will be there with regard to COVID-19 and uh, global access to vaccines. However, it's important to stress that many of them um, said here, uh, said in their virtual uh, conference, video conference, that it's uh, very important to um, coordinate their efforts and that uh, it is very important for everyone to have access to a vaccine. Uh, French President Macron stressed that this is a test for G20. We just heard uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel talking about uh, the importance of strengthening international organizations. Uh, the only one, however, who who didn't talk about the global situation was U.S. President Donald Trump, who praised his economy and his administration's effort to develop a vaccine to support uh, companies developing um, um, a vaccine. And his message to the leaders was basically uh, he wants to vaccinate U.S. citizens first. All right. Uh, what's on the agenda today? Climate change is expected to top the agenda today. And of course, it is a very important topic from the European perspective. And following the EU, uh, EU's example, half of the G20 members uh, are planning to uh, be carbon neutral by 2050. But it is traditionally a topic that it's very difficult to agree upon. And of course, here again, uh, we have to straight that this is a very strange summit uh, held uh, virtually you don't really you can have a real discussion we have the you have the mute button but maybe difficulties with uh, technical issues what is missing are bilateral meetings and direct talks uh, among the leaders lots of pre-recorded messages there as well uh, Saudi Arabia's human rights violations have repeatedly been pointed out ahead of this summit uh, before we talk about that Alexandra let's have a look at women's rights in the kingdom because human rights groups say Saudi women are still oppressed despite the country's efforts to prove the opposite it was this video that got Lou Jane al Hathlou thrown into prison the first time around back in 2014 she was driving a car, something that was then still illegal for women in Saudi Arabia. Men who want to stop us from driving are doing us an injustice. They are oppressing us. 
After she was released, Al Hathlou continued to campaign for women's rights at home and publicly while abroad. That's why in 2018 she was put in prison again. There she's been tortured and raped, according to her sister, who lives in exile. Now Lu Jane has apparently gone on hunger strike. They want to silence her and the only way to do it is to break her, to punish her, to punish her family. And um, I think they, they are not able to release a strong woman who will be willing to, to, to speak about everything that had happened to her. Many think that would contradict the image of Saudi women the royal family wants to portray. Women who do business, travel, sports and, yes, since 2018 are even allowed to drive. Some believe these are simply cosmetic reforms by Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman to get more women into the workforce. Rights activists say the reality is very different. What makes Saudi Arabia extremely hypocritical uh, on, on this front is the fact that they detained and went after uh, quite vigorously the entire Saudi women's rights movement, uh, arresting dozens of activists beginning in May of 2018. Nevertheless, the Saudi royals have put women's rights high on the agenda at the G20 summit, portraying themselves as open and liberal-minded leaders. Lina al Hathlou says the West should confront Riyadh on this contradiction. Saudi Arabia refuses to engage with us, so it's the duty of uh, our allies, of the international community, to, to stand by us and to ask uh, where Lujain is and um, to ask for her release. Perhaps this is her last chance, because until now, Riyadh has rejected any external intervention. Alexandra, back to you. Riyadh's human rights record very much in the spotlight these days. Have world leaders raised the issue with Saudi Arabia directly? Um, no, at least not in uh, the uh, official meetings uh, they are having. Uh, many leaders indicated that um, human rights issues um, are being raised in bilateral um, meetings with Saudi Arabia. I also asked the EU Commission whether they are going to talk about it and was also told that uh, uh, bilaterally, yes, but not uh, during uh, this G20 summit because, uh, as they told me, it is a multilateral uh, event uh, with many important issues issues at stake, uh, so uh, that was their answer to the topic. This is, of course, the last G20 summit for U.S. President Donald Trump. You already talked briefly about his remarks regarding vaccination efforts. Overall, how is he bow bowing out of the international arena? Well, I think that his, uh, his statement yesterday was quite awkward. Uh, he told the leaders that he was looking forward to working with them together for a long time, so still not conceding his defeat. So he missed basically the chance to properly say goodbye. We'll see what he has to say uh, today. He also skipped part of the video conference with the leaders and uh, um, went golfing. So that's also a, a strange signal. Uh, and I think that... Uh, Many leaders are looking forward to working with President-elect Joe Biden because uh, uh, they hoped and uh, they know actually that he uh, has a lot of respect for multilateralism, for working together and for G20. Brussels Bureau Chief Alexandra von Naaman, thank you very much.